Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily, a third year student from Keeble, and welcome to our final international talk this week. So these talks have been brought to you by Oikyu, a bunch of Jesus-loving folk who just want to share the good news. Today's talk is on what is pleasing to God, how good is good enough. Now, I'm from Singapore, and traditionally, being good enough back home means consistently being top of your class and then probably becoming a doctor, neither of which I've done. Sorry, mom and dad. But that makes me extra excited to hear what Peter Teagle has to say today about being good enough for God. So, Peter. Peter has, for the past 20 years, worked for Friends International, which is a Christian charity seeking to grow friendship and faith with international students in the UK and Ireland. So, Peter. Yes. Before we start, I've got to ask you a question, keeping in line with the theme of being pleasing. What's an international food that you've tried that's pleasantly surprised you? That pleasantly surprised me. Well, a lot has pleasantly surprised me. Um, so, yes, I think most of my adult life has been a culinary adventure. So, for those of you who know what this means, my wife is Paranakan, uh, which means that uh, well, she's from Singapore and she has a kind of background where it's a lot of um, Malay food mixed with Chinese food. Um, but actually, the most probably slightly shocking thing that I've eaten, which actually tasted lovely, was in China when um, we were visiting a student who we'd known uh, when we lived in Birmingham, and uh, uh, her boyfriend and she took us out for a very expensive, very beautiful meal. And um, in the middle of the meal, they presented a dish, which was kind of like a glass dish, which had a brown liquid in it, which was moving. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's prawns. And I thought, that's okay, because I know that and sometimes they, they will show you how fresh it is, and then go away and cook it and bring it back. They never took it away. <laughs> they just added wine until they kind of stopped moving. And just when they stop, stop moving, that's when you eat them. So it's paralytic prawns. And I thought, okay, I've never eaten anything that's still alive before. Uh, actually, it tasted lovely. It was fine. It just tasted like normal prawns, very fresh. Um, but I have to say, one of those um, prayers that you pray, Lord, I will take it down if you keep it down. That's amazing. I don't think I would do that, but I'm glad you had a good experience with it. Yeah. Um, okay, so throughout the talk, there's going to be a Slido link that's open. So if you have any questions, you can just go to Slido. The code is 288994, and we'll have a quick Q&A at the end. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see a very full room. It's Friday night, and uh, I'm sure the night is young. You've got other things to go to later, including another great talk. Um, I'm going to, well, before I um, start, I just want to uh, shamelessly advertise a book which is on your table, um, written by me. Um, I wrote this uh, uh, just over a year ago when uh, basically I put together the 20 most commonly asked questions that I've had over the last 30 years from international students from a range of non-Western cultures. Uh, my wife and I have really dedicated our lives to trying to understand different cultures and particularly how Jesus Christ, the Christian faith, and the Bible applies to non-Western cultures. My wife is doing a PhD in uh, the spiritual journey of Chinese students who perhaps come from a completely different background to, say, myself. And so this book, really, you can just you can give it to a friend or you can read it in any order it not supposed to necessarily read it from beginning to end, just choose a question which interests you and read it at your leisure. It's free, so um, I can't go wrong. So before I start, I'd like to read you um, a part of the Bible. It's on your little sheets that you've got on the table. And um, it's a really lovely uh, true story of Jesus' interaction with a rich young man. Maybe if you have time later, it'd be good to kind of look, at this, look this up in the Bible and read the, the, the stories around it. But this is just a lovely story. Um, and let me read it out to you. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is for, to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. I'm just going to read a little bit further just to give us a bit more context. And then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So I'm going to speak on that mostly up to verse 27, uh, so keep it in front of you so you know what I'm referring to. Now, um, I met my wife at university, and um, we kind of, she was in the Christian Union, as was I, uh, but we kind of got to know each other over the dinner table. And we got our first date out of a mistake. Um, because uh, she said, one day, have you ever had Chinese food? And I admitted that I hadn't. She said, we should go out for dinner sometime. Meaning, we the eight people on our table. I thought she meant we the two of us. And quickly before she changed her mind, I arranged a date that Friday. The rest, as they say, is history. But very quickly, within a few months, Lynette's parents on the other side of the world had started hearing stories about this boy called Peter, and very naturally they wanted to meet me. So they invited me to come for the whole summer. Now, if you go to visit your girlfriend's parents for dinner, that's one thing. This is 11 weeks on the other side of the world. The kind of thing that could go really, really well, or really, really badly. And I was terrified. Now, I didn't need to worry too much about Lynette's mum. Uh, I kind of knew that she was quite like Lynette, and um, actually she tested me by giving me sea slug stew on the first day, and uh, jellyfish tentacles on the second day, and steam congealed chicken's blood on the third day. Later, I discovered that she just wanted to make sure that her daughter wasn't going to be condemned to a life of fish and chips. But it was her dad. Nobody could tell me what his reaction was going to be for the prospect of having potentially an English son-in-law. Uh, and so I was very nervous about meeting him. And because I was staying the whole summer, I tried to find a suitable gift that I could bring him to just kind of say thank you or, you know, just uh, for good etiquette. And I couldn't think of anything to give him. And nobody seemed to be very helpful. No one could suggest anything. So in the end, I decided on a tie pin. You know those clips that go on ties. Exciting, I know. I really couldn't think of a thing else. And one day my mum said to me, so what did you decide in the end to buy for Lynette's dad? And I said, this tie pin. She said, oh, I'm not sure that's suitable. And I was so tense, I literally burst into tears. She said, oh no, I'm sure it's fine, I'm sure it's fine. Anyway, I needn't have worried because when I arrived, um, he was extremely welcoming, and uh, what I discovered very quickly was the tie pin was, you know, he doesn't wear ties. <laughs> but he wasn't interested in what I could give him. What he was interested in was what he could give me. And from the very first day, he wanted to be my host. He wanted to 
take me out for dinner. He wanted to chat to me every day. And we, since then, for the last 33 years, we've always had a really good relationship. Because, as I say, I, there's nothing that I could give him that would impress him. He was a doctor. I failed to get into medicine. He's a very educated man. My parents don't come, aren't necessarily, well, they're pretty bright, but they didn't go to university. I just thought I was too ordinary for their daughter. But that wasn't the case. He was more interested in showing me hospitality. It's one thing to be thought of as good enough for our parents, for our parents-in-law, for society, for our friends. But it's another thing, what does it really mean to be good enough for God? Religions around the world, at least the major ones, teach us about being good. Buddhism has five precepts, or eight or ten, depending on your school. Islam has ten commandments, which are similar but subtly different from the Jewish ten commandments. Christians also use the Jewish ten commandments. Moral philosopher Confucius based everything around five relationships which we need to honor. And if you were around on Tuesday, um, I said this at lunchtime, but um, it's a little bit like uh, all these religions say that you should do this and not do that. But nobody tells you how much good is good enough. That if you're weighing up the, you know, you've got to go through life and avoid the bad things and just do the good things, but to make sure that the good things outweigh the bad things, but nobody tells you when you've done it. So it's a little bit like trying to run a race uh, where nobody tells you which direction to run in or how far away the finishing line is. The other analogy I used on Tuesday, which I'll say again, is uh, some friends of ours have just had a baby girl. And if you can imagine someone coming around to their house and saying, oh, congratulations on the birth of your daughter. And if they said, oh no, she's not our daughter yet. I mean, we don't know whether she'll be good enough. I mean, we'll feed her and clothe her and send her to school for the next 18 years. And then if she's good enough and if she doesn't uh, embarrass us, then maybe we'll start calling her our daughter. Can you imagine that? And yet so often religion, any religion, tends to give us this impression that God is like that. So what possibly could Jesus add to this? Does Jesus add anything else? Or is he just bringing another set of morals, which in a sense is no different from any other. Or does he? Now, the Bible story that we read was actually a conversation that happened between Jesus and a kind of young man that mothers would love to introduce to their daughters. And fathers would love to marry off to their daughters. The kind of guy who was young, respectful, moral, religious, and rich. And most people would have thought that he was a good person. But he came to Jesus with this question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now let's be clear what, G what this young man is asking. He is not asking just to live forever. The Chinese Emperor Tin Shi Huang wanted to live forever and did what he could to try to, to, to live as permanently as possible. He didn't really want to die. But when the Bible talks about eternal life, it's talking about living with God, in relationship with God, in peace with God, now in this life and on into the next life. And this young man thinks he's probably a good guy, or he's trying to be, but he wants to make sure he wants to ask if there's anything extra that he needs to do. Maybe he's hoping that Jesus will say to him, no, don't worry, you're a good guy, just keep doing what you're doing. But right from the beginning, Jesus challenges his assumptions. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Now, hang on a minute. <laughs> if anybody is good, then surely Jesus qualifies. You know, we think of people as good people and bad people. Well, bad people are kind of murderers and uh, Hitler and, um, I don't know, criminals. It's actually much harder to define what a good person is 
most people would probably say, like me or better. But actually, Jesus says, no one is good except God. Now, Jesus elsewhere both says directly and implies that he himself is God. So even by this definition, Jesus is good. And Jesus lived a perfect life. But what he's doing is he's challenging this man's assumptions. You see, this young man probably just recognizes or thinks of Jesus as a Jewish religious teacher. But Jesus is saying, don't use the common standard of goodness because that just isn't enough. At the end of the day, what I think is good, what you think is good, what that young man thought is good, doesn't matter. It's what God thinks is good that matters. But then Jesus kind of makes things a little bit easier for him, brings it down to his level. Uh, and so he asks him, well, what, by what measure would you say is a good standard of goodness? And Jesus quotes examples from the moral law, uh, which is what we call the Ten Commandments, the basic minimum standard of morality. And these include things like do not murder, which most people would have no problem with. Um, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie in court, honor your father and mother. No problem, surely. Now, everyone in this room has some standard of morality, some standard of goodness. And these are either by the laws of the religion which we follow, or by the way we've been brought up, or by our society, or simply by our own conscience. Even some of us have very strict moral codes, and we follow a lot of rules. Others will basically say, um, I'll do what I like as long as I'm not hurting anyone. And this young man claims that he has always kept his own basic minimum standard of goodness. He's never cheated, he's never lied, he's never stolen anything, he's always honored his mum and dad. Well, I'm not sure that I could say the same. Now, the thing is, we often break, we often have trouble not necessarily reaching God's standard of goodness, I have trouble reaching my own standard of goodness. When I was uh, still an atheist, um, I went to, into Manchester on the bus with some friends from college, two girls, that's important for the story, and um, they, they said, do you have a, uh, a student bus pass? I said, uh, no, I've only got a student train pass. Now, I, my dad was a tax inspector, and in my family, scrupulous honesty with money was a big thing. Uh, and, um, and yet, when, under, under pressure from these two girls, I caved in. I did what they suggested, which was to flash my train pass and pay the five pence fare, uh, which students could pay in those days. Uh, and actually, I was, felt so guilty about it that when I walked off without my change and the bus driver shouted after me, I thought he was going to throw me in prison or something. But here when we come to the turning point in the conversation, verse 21 says something really important. Jesus looked at him and loved him. That means that Anything else that happens after this, whatever Jesus says, no matter how hard it may seem, no, how, no matter how difficult it feels for us to understand, what Jesus says was said out of love and compassion for this young man. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, Jesus didn't go around telling everyone to give away all their money all the time. Uh, another story, Jesus seemed to be quite happy with a guy giving half of his money. Uh, sometimes, often, the, whole, the issue of money doesn't even come up. And Christians, of course, have bank accounts and mortgages and cars and stuff. So why was he picking on this guy, knowing that he had a lot of money? Well, firstly, it seems that there seemed to be a limit as to how good this young man was willing to be. I'll be good, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, but please don't ask me to do this. 
because I'm not willing to go any further than that. But secondly, there seems also a deeper reason that Jesus asked this because, because he didn't quite recognize really what he was asking in the first place. Now, some years ago, my wife's family came to Oxford uh, to celebrate Christmas with us. Uh, that's her parents, her brother, his wife, their three kids. And they said, when we come to Oxford, we would like to see snow. Um, well, I can't order it. My prayer life is good, but not that good. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, let, let's uh, arrange a place to go to where we could guarantee to see snow. So we arranged a holiday to Austria, to a ski resort. Pretty guaranteed, right? So the day came when all 12 of us, so that's my parents-in-law, my brother-in-law, his wife, their three kids, our three kids, and my wife and I, all went down in two cars from Oxford down to Gatwick Airport. And on the way to the airport, it started snowing. And it snowed so much that by the time we got to the airport, all the flights were being canceled, and ours was the very last flight to be canceled. We put our seatbelts on, and then we had to get off again. The, the airport was in utter chaos. Everyone was just trying to get their bags and go home. So my wife and I thought, right, we'll look after everyone. So we got everyone seated at one end of the baggage hall, grandparents, three of the, two of the four parents, and all six children. And my wife and I went maybe 50 meters the other way to go and get everyone's bags. And in the middle of this chaos and kind of crowd, my wife turns to me and she said, I need to get my parents a drink. I thought, now? <laughs> really, now? And I knew what she was doing. She felt responsible to look after her parents in that situation. But I thought we were looking after her parents because we were getting their bags. And I looked over and I saw where they were sitting and they were sitting next to the only drinks machine in the place. Now her parents are retired doctors. Her brother is a consultant anaesthetist. His wife is also a GP. I thought between them, four doctors could, should be able to work out how to use one drinks machine. Maybe I'm wrong. I said, oh, goodness me, that's too much, meaning it was too awkward. She said, you don't understand. I thought, well, I don't like it when people tell me I don't understand. I thought, what is it I don't understand? I've lived in China. I've lived in Singapore for a number of years. I've been married into a Chinese family for 20 years. I've even read the works of Confucius. What is it I don't understand? She said, you don't understand because it is never too much to do something for your parents. You see, what I was saying when I said enough was actually putting a limit on love. I was saying, this is a reasonable amount, this is too much, whatever that is. And in the same way, this rich young man was putting a limit on how much he would be willing to love God. He was saying, how much Jesus is enough to love God in order to get myself into heaven? And the whole fact that he asked that showed that he was putting a limit on love. Really challenging him, saying, you want to live forever, you want to be in a relationship of, with God of, of all-surpassing joy and peace uh, and happiness for eternity. Well, do you think he's worth it? Do you think he's worth it? And sadly, the young man wasn't very sure. The thing is, I wonder if you would think that's a little bit unfair. Maybe you're surprised who has hope then of attaining this impossible goal of pleasing God? Well, you're in good company because the followers of Jesus at the time also struggled with this. They were amazed because the way that they had been brought up was, if you're rich, God must like you. And so for this young man who was moral and upright and polite and respectful and rich, surely he would go to heaven, no problem. Who then can be saved? Who could be good enough? But Jesus reassures them, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What I'm trying to say is that this rich man thought that he had pretty much the whole of life sewn up. And that perhaps he was a little bit far off being completely accepted by God. 
but he'd misunderstood the fact that we are all in the same position. You see, that's the bad news. And the sad thing is that this young man left the conversation before he got on to the good news. You see, none of us are actually good enough for God, but the good news is that Jesus is. And the central heart of Christianity is that Jesus himself, who is perfect, gave his life as an exchange so that, Jesus, so that God would be willing to look at the life of Jesus and accept his life in return for ours. It's a little bit like, as one person uh, said to me, um, it's a bit like doing an impossible test paper where the, mark, the pass mark is 100%. But then Jesus comes along, does the paper, gets full marks, and then puts your name on the top of it. Let me tell you a story about two women uh, who we knew when we lived in Birmingham. Uh, one was a very intelligent, sophisticated, a very together Chinese postgraduate student in law from Dalian in China. Uh, her name was Lan. The other was a very, um, very ordinary uh, English lady who had been born and brought up in Birmingham with very little education. Her name was Kim. Now, Lan, the Chinese girl, came to our house for dinner once uh, around Christmas time, and she said uh, she saw something in the chaos of our family life that she liked, and she said she wanted to find out more about the Christian faith. So she studied the Bible with us, and then uh, some other people, and then a few months later, she called me. She said, Peter, I really enjoy what I've been learning about Jesus Christ and the Christian faith. And I agree with it, except that it keeps talking about forgiveness. And I don't need to be forgiven, she said. I'm a good person. I haven't done anything wrong. Possibly what she was also doing was, in English, the word sin, which is from the Bible, encompasses a, a, a broad range of things. But in Chinese, it's either the word taught, oops, I've made a mistake, I've dialed the wrong number, or zui, not if I'm saying the right words. Oh, good. Zui <laughs> uh, means crime. I, everyone makes mistakes, but I'm not a criminal. So I tried to talk her through it a little bit, but I'm not sure how far I got. But two weeks later, she had this experience. She went into a, um, a, a shop where she was getting some photocopying done, and the lady in front of her was an older lady, and she was completely messing it up. She was putting the paper in the wrong way around and jamming the paper in and just taking forever. And Lan was getting really irritated and started making sarcastic comments. And she was quite pleased that her English was good enough to be sarcastic. But then when she left the shop, she had a sudden realization that actually she's not as good as she thinks she is sometimes. And just perhaps she might need forgiveness too. Now that was just the open door. And actually what that allowed was for God to show her things in her life that actually that she was deeply ashamed of, but she'd hidden, that actually God wanted to come in and forgive her and renew her from the inside. But until she was willing to open that door, Jesus couldn't do that. And her life was transformed. Uh, her, I think pretty much her whole family now believe in Jesus, and she's, her life was catapulted into a, a new and really wonderful life. At the same time, there was this lady who used to take her children to the same school as I took my children to, primary school. And this was this lady, Kim. I didn't really know her. All I knew her was she was the scary, sweary lady. She was really tough. She's quite tall, quite pretty lady with tattoos everywhere. And she swore constantly the F word in front of her kids, in front of our kids, in front of the teachers. She didn't care. She even got into a scrap, a fist fight, with another mother in the school playground. And the police had to be called to separate them. I didn't talk to her because she was pretty scary. And then months later, I noticed her smiling. And it took me a little while to realize that I'd never seen her smile before. Uh, and then she kind of, she talked to me on a couple of occasions. She stopped to chat to me. And that was weird. Uh, and then I noticed that her face looked softer and she looked happy. And she stopped swearing. Now, I didn't think any more, thing more of it. I was puzzled. But then we moved to Oxford, and then a couple of years later, I was telling 
a friend who still lived in Birmingham about this, and she immediately said, oh, you mean Kim? I said, do I? <laughs> she said, yes. Well, Kim's story was that her partner left and left her alone with three children, nowhere to live, really stuck in her money, and an older Christian couple just looked after this little family and did everything for them. Picked up the kids from school, made sure they're clean, they had clean clothes, and cooked for them, just loved them. And after months of this, this uh, lady, Kim, turned to her Christian friend and said, I've made a real mess of my life. Do you think if I ask Jesus to forgive me, he will let me start again? And of course, the answer was yes. And she was set free, so much so that even just walking down the road, I could see on her face the difference that this had made. Now, I tell you this because two women, roughly the same age, from very different backgrounds, both of them experienced the incredible freedom and joy. Both of them experienced what this young man asked Jesus for, the freedom of forgiveness in the deepest, darkest place. But one of them almost missed it. One of them almost walked away because at first she thought she was too good to need it. If we try to prove that we are good enough and expect God to accept us, then we actually dishonor him. But if we are willing to come humbly and to ask his forgiveness, to recognize that none of us can attain this impossible standard, but Jesus has done it for us, and if we are willing to trust Jesus and accept him, come what may, and Jesus in this passage talks about it is tough to follow him. If we recognize that following him is worth more than anything else that this life can give, then that gift is ours. But one more thing to learn from this young man. Please, please don't walk away until you know for sure what or who you're walking away from. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter, for that. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a Q&A now. It is 7.13, so if you need to go, please do. Um, but we have a few questions that we'd like to dive into. Firstly, someone has asked, how can we practically balance pressure to perform with knowing that regardless, God loves us? Say that one again. How can we practically balance pressure to perform with knowing that regardless, God loves us? So pressure to perform, pretty much a lot of us are in that situation. You know, whether the pressure is to perform for our teachers, uh, for, uh, for our parents, um, for society, for our friends, um, um, for social media. Um, and I think actually it is very, uh, it's like a trap sometimes. We end up feeling completely stuck because no matter how we try to please one person, we end up not pleasing another. You know, we do everything that we can for our tutors, only to find that the standard's not quite right, or that we do everything that, but we lose our friends, or we, we please our friends, but we don't please our parents, and so it's an endless round. But actually, if we come and find out what our relationship with God is, remember when I said about the little girl who was born, when we enter into that relationship with God as Lan and as Kim did, we become sons and daughters of the king. And no matter what happens, he therefore loves us. And it's on the basis of love that we can therefore change. No amount of rules can change a person. Adding rules just makes things worse. But setting a person free to be in a relationship of love, that changes a person. So we're all under pressure to perform. But if we can get this one thing right, then with the ups and downs of stuff that goes on, and, and it doesn't necessarily go away. My wife is trying to finish her PhD in the next few weeks, and boy, is she under some pressure. 
But she knows that's not who she is inside. She knows that that's just part of her life. Her identity is not PhD candidate. Her identity is daughter of the king. Thank you for that. Um, next, we have a question about, is it unfair that people in the Old Testament had to follow these strict rules, but nowadays Christians don't? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> is it unfair that people in the Old Testament had to follow rules, and then people in the New Testament don't? Well, let, let's be clear that, you know, Christians obey what God says. It's not like, you know, the rules are scrapped. You know, there's still, uh, in fact, actually Jesus increases the standard. In the Old Testament, God said, do not murder. Most of us manage that one. Yes? Anybody murdered anyone? Well, you wouldn't have missed me. <laughs> um, but then Jesus raises the bar higher and says, it's not enough to just not murder someone. You mustn't hate and resent someone. Well, okay, then we're all implicated, aren't we? But the, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not that God has changed. It's that our relationship with him has changed because of Jesus. The Jews had 613 laws to follow because theirs was an, like at the beginning of a new whole culture. Everything from do not murder to how you should cut your hair. But when it came to the New Testament, it, the, the knowledge of God was going to spread through all the world, and therefore be adaptable to any culture. So it became something which is about what goes on inside. But if you actually also look at the Old Testament, that was what it was about all along anyway. Because those people who really please God were not necessarily the people who got it all right. They were people who believed in him, who loved him, and came back to him when they had done wrong for forgiveness. Do come back to me if there's a follow-up question on that one. Thank you. Okay, next we have, if we know that we can have eternal life through Jesus, why should we work hard? Mm. Yeah, this is one of those things where if you ask that question, then you've nearly understood. Okay, it's like a test case, that question. If you think, oh, that sounds too easy, then you've almost but not quite understood. Is it really that God doesn't care what we do? No, he cares very much. But if you, um, if again, if you go back to that picture of the baby daughter who is uh, um, a child right from the beginning, she knows that she's loved. She knows that she can be disciplined. She knows that she can get into trouble with mum and dad. But she still knows that she's loved. That creates a safety. That creates a, a, a peace and a calmness and a security on the basis with which that girl can grow up and become a better person become the person that her parents are trying to bring her up to be. But if those parents said, we're not going to treat you as a daughter until you prove yourself, what will happen? She'll go the opposite way because she'll feel that she can never achieve it. This is called grace. And it is only through grace that we can ever really hope to change on the inside. Rules do not help us alone, but change on the inside through the power of God does. I, I may just follow up on that last one. I think it's wrong to believe that it doesn't matter what we do. So some people say, well, God is going to forgive me anyway, and I don't really care, because he's going to forgive me. When that happens, we just find ourselves further and further and further away from God. And therefore, we enjoy nothing of him. And actually, that is a very dangerous position to be in. Um, and so... It isn't just a kind of free-for-all, do what you like. It is quite the opposite. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for your sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, so that's it for this talk. We do have another talk at 8 p.m. in the main hall. That was, is on what if I could find true joy. Um, so we'd love for you guys to stick around, to have a chat with the people who brought you here. Peter's also going to be around if you have any questions that you want to talk to him about. Um, and a few things to plug. If you liked the discussions that we've been having this week, we do have the search um, every Monday, Costa Coffee, 7.30.
um, just have a chat over free coffee and cake about some of your big quest questions. Um, also, specifically for international students, but everyone is welcome. Cafe 360 every Friday, 7 p.m. at Formosan Bubble Tea Bar. Free bubble tea, again. So yeah, thank you, and please stick around.